Hey everybody, Eric Grenia here and welcome to the 45th episode of the RIT podcast. On Wednesday night, the conservative leadership candidates were gathered in Laval to debate in French. It's the last debate before the June 3rd membership cutoff. So to join me to discuss what happened in the, the debate and what it might mean for the rest of the campaign, I'm joined by Stephanie Chouinard, who's a political science professor at the Royal Military College. Stephanie, bonjour. Bonjour, thanks for having me. So uh, before we get into the debate itself, uh, maybe we should set the stage a little bit. You know, Quebec is important for the conservative leadership race because all 78 ridings are going to be equally weighted. Uh, there's a, perhaps another dozen ridings across the country where there's a significant French speaking population. Uh, so it does matter in terms of the point system and, and determining the winner. But what do you think is the importance of having a debate in French for the party? Well, one of the other reasons, aside from the 100 or so seats that we consider where the Francophone population is sizable enough uh, to, uh, to, to warrant this kind of debate, is also to test out uh, the candidate's proficiency in the other official language, right? It's not just for Francophones, it's also for the rest of the country to see which one of the candidates can really speak to all of Canadians in both official languages. And this is not a written rule, it's not written anywhere, uh, but uh, as we saw last night, we have three candidates who more or less disqualified themselves because they're just not able to really communicate in both official languages. And, and that remains something that most Canadians think is important in someone who's vying for the role of prime minister. Right. So it's not just about being able to speak to Francophone Quebecers. It is often to speak often to perhaps Ontarians, uh, people who uh, want to see that the potential prime minister is going to be able to communicate to uh, the big portion of Francophones in Canada and contribute to national unity, that having a unilingual Anglophone leader might not be uh, something that is what you want to have in your prime minister. Yeah, it's for, for the vast majority of Canadians today, it's seen as uh, something that just wouldn't be acceptable, uh, even if obviously um, you know, we've had prime ministers in the past who've had to work on their French. Uh, Stephen Harper is a notable example of that in his tenure as prime minister. His French improved notably, and everyone uh, it was witness to that. Uh, so, you know, right as you go into the job, you don't need to have perfect fluency, but there's an expectation that you can get your points across in both languages. And it's uh, not only about even francophones in Quebec. I mean, uh, I believe you're from New Brunswick, but you live also in Ontario now. Um, does it matter as much, do you think, to francophones outside of Quebec that the leader is able to speak in French? It does matter a great deal, uh, because oftentimes, if you have the proficiency in the language, that means you also know those communities and you realize uh, that uh, the French fact in Canada is not just found in Quebec, and that in fact you have the bilingual belt where you have regions of New Brunswick and Ontario where Francophones are actually the majority, and then you have pockets and different communities throughout all of the provinces and territories uh, who do pay, pay attention a great deal to federal politics uh, because the federal government by and large is seen as the champion of official languages in our country and uh, are very keen to see that the folks vying for the role of prime minister will be paying attention to them as well. Yeah, and of course, Pierre Poliev is... Um... He said, I believe his grandfather was an immigrant from France who came in, uh, when there was the settlement of Saskatchewan and Western Canada earlier on. So it's a different kind of history for one of the candidates there compared to, say, Jean Charest. So uh, let's get into the debate itself. Before we get into how the candidates performed and, and what they went after, uh, you know, in terms of going after each other, that kind of thing. What did you make of the debate itself, particularly in comparison to the one we saw in English uh, two weeks before? The first thing I will say is the format was a hundred times better. Uh, I think everyone appreciated that uh, there was actually time for a debate between the different candidates. Now, obviously because of the French fluency, some candidates were able to make better use of that time than others, but, but there was an actual debate. Uh, the moderator was also very keen on keeping track of time and uh, making sure that uh, everyone was able to, to, to get in a word. Uh, so the format itself, as well as the 10 thematics that were, that were chosen, uh, I think that was done quite well. Uh, and I think that uh, folks who, who watched and were able to compare with the debate that happened in, in Edmonton two weeks ago really appreciated that we didn't take the same format as, as two weeks ago, uh, both uh, for reasons of, of clarity and for reasons of substance. 
yeah, the the English debate was almost in some ways a lightning round, and sometimes candidates had 15 seconds to answer. Here it was around 45 seconds to get an initial answer to the question and then four minutes of open debate, which allowed those who were able to speak French to actually occupy most of that time. It would have been a bit painful if we would have had those uh, face-offs between two candidates that we saw in the English debate if it had been between Roman Baber and Scott Aitchison uh, trying to fill four minutes in French. That would have been not very respectful for the audience. So let's start with those three candidates. So Les and Lewis, Scott Aitchison, Roman Baber, um, all they did was read from notes, and it wasn't always clear that they understood the question, because if there was a question about illegal immigration, then they took out the note that had something to, about immigration. If it was something about the uh, governor general being able to speak French, well, they just took the note out that had something about the importance of the French language. Um, and at least Scott Aitchison, he did not try to insert themselves into the open debate, uh, whereas sometimes you had Leslie Lewis and Roman Baber decide to try to say something. Often it was not at all what the others were talking about, which really kind of cut up the flow. But what do you make of the fact that there's these three candidates, including Lewis, who this is the second time around, and by my years, her French did not get any better. No, uh, for Mr. Baber and Mr. Aitchison, who's, for whom it, it's the first time around, you know, uh, it's a little bit more understandable, but this is Leslin Lewis's uh, second kick at the can, so to speak. And it's unfortunate that she did not make use of that time, especially since she's now an elected MP and she has free access to, uh, to uh, second language training uh, through the House of Commons to, to improve her French. Uh, obviously, you know, it, it's, it's not easy to learn a second language. Uh, I think you and I are both keenly aware of that and you don't you don't do that uh in in a few weeks um but when you're going for the top job again it, it's something that you really need to show that you can improve on and that you're making efforts uh, now i think despite the fact that sometimes their comments were a little bit off compared to the the precise question that the moderator asked uh we did get some points across and and, and some policy ideas from all of the candidates so i thought that was still helpful but you're right, in the four minute debate part, uh, when they were trying to insert themselves, sometimes they were really cutting the flow of, uh, of the discussion, the debate that was going on. And that was rather unfortunate. Yeah, I remember there was a good moment. I can't recall exactly what they were debating, but Poilievre and Charest were going after each other on something. It was really interesting to hear what they were going to say. And then Liz and Lewis came in to say something about how she loved learning the French language. It was really just um, not, I don't think, what the audience really wanted to hear either. You could kind of sense sometimes from even the moderator, there was a little bit of impatience with some of the other candidates in, in trying to get in on it. But um, one, more, one more point on the quality of the French. Uh, Patrick Brown, I think this was a big test because we hadn't really seen him much. We'd seen him ask a few, uh, answer a few questions from journalists now and then. Uh, and I was curious to see if he was going to be someone who kept largely to notes, and he didn't. He, he was okay. trying his best to be involved, be engaged, answer the actual questions that were being asked. What did you make of, of his first the quality of you know, his, his involvement? Yeah, I was curious to see how he would fare because I remembered him from when he was the leader of the Progressive Conservatives in Ontario before he got ousted in, in 2018. And I remembered that he was making efforts already at that time to speak to the Franco-Ontarian community. Uh, and so I was wondering, you know, if he had kept up with his French and, uh, and he was definitely, uh, you know, able to get his point across better than the three other candidates uh, whom we, we, we just talked about. However, I also noticed that uh, Mr. Brown really used this time to troll Pierre Poilievre more so than to defend himself <laughs> or, to, or to get his own points across. Uh, he really seemed like he was uh, at, uh, at some points in the debate playing interference for Jean Charest rather than trying to be his, his own candidate on the stage, which must have been quite annoying to Pierre Poilievre, as a matter of fact, because he was, he was standing right next to him and uh, was often cutting him off uh, when, when he was trying to, to attack Mr. Charest. Uh, so we're already seeing, you know, alliances being being drawn. And in the case of the, the, the Charest Brown alliance, um, there's not that much of a surprise there. We already knew that they were ideologically sort of in the same camp. Yeah, it definitely was not even that subtle. It was almost any time that Pierre Poliev was really attacking Jean Charest that Patrick Brown decided to 
step all over his message as much as he could. There was a moment when uh, uh, Poliev was going after Charest on, on Huawei and his contract and was trying to do the same thing he'd done in English, repeating again and again how much he had gotten paid. And Patrick Brown just kept on repeating on his side uh, that uh, there was an executive from Huawei who was supporting Poliev's campaign. I'm not sure who, who what he was talking about exactly, but he kept on repeating it again and again and again and again, just as long as Poliev was repeating his attack line. So it did almost feel like Brown was there, as you said, playing interference for Jean Charest. He, and it, it wasn't something that we saw in the English debate, but it was really obvious in the French debate. And, you know, in one hand, it could be that Patrick Brown was trying to defend Charest, but you can also see, as you said, in alliance here that those two are fighting to be the one who's going to be on the last ballot against Poliev. And Brown might have been making an effort to try to get the crowd, which was pretty friendly to Jean Charest, at least much more friendly than in Edmonton, um, Edmonton yeah, absolutely. To, to rank Brown second. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I, I think, you know, if you're looking at the policies, it's already clear that uh, Brown is, is the closest ally to Jean Charest. Uh, and as as we know, with the ranked ballot, you know, uh, we're going to have a divide here between the more uh, radical uh, part of, of the party, those who respond better to the populist type of rhetoric that we've been hearing from Poiliev, as well as uh, Leslin Lewis and Roman Babber to, to a certain extent, and those who are uh, on, the, on, on the more centrist side of the party, such as Charest, Brown, and Scotch. HSN is trying to play both, I think, uh, in, in a sense, by uh, trying to keep things civilized and not really doing the, the populist game, uh, but still being further to the right ideologically than uh, Brown and Charest are. There was a moment, uh, so one of the things that was discussed pretty often during the debate was Bill 21 and uh, Bill 96. Um, and almost it was inserted primarily by the candidates. Uh, the moderator didn't really get that much into that topic. Um, but I thought it was interesting that you did have them each take a position on uh, Bill 21 and Bill 96. Uh, you had uh, Babber attacking both of them. You had Aitchison doing the same thing, uh, Lewis as well. Poliev was saying how he didn't support these things, but that it wasn't really clear what he said in terms of whether he would challenge it in the courts. Uh, Brown said he definitely would, and Charest more or less has the same position as Trudeau in the sense of wanting to speak to it if it gets to the courts, but not exactly being leading the charge against it. But when you have that alliance between Brown and Charest on everything else, they don't seem to be very closely aligned on that, at least as closely aligned as Brown and, and Lewis or Brown and HSO. That's true. Uh, and, and Patrick Brown had already started hammering at, uh, at uh, Bill 21 when he was mayor of Brampton. If we recall, he had started a fundraiser to help uh, the, uh, the folks in, in Montreal who were, uh, who were challenging uh, the bill and had called upon uh, other mayors in, in Canada to, to join him. Uh, and I think that was, uh, that was last winter. Uh, whereas Charest, we can see that he's a lot more prudent. He knows uh, intrinsically that uh, despite how detestable uh, Bill 21 may seem uh, outside of Quebec, that in fact, the majority of Quebecers do support this bill. And, and so if he wants to, to win uh, in, in his own uh, you know, heartland, which he really needs to at this point, if he wants to have a shot at this, at this leadership race, he needs to tone down that message. And I think that's why we are seeing Charest being a lot more prudent, speak a lot more to the kind of rhetoric that pleases nationalist Quebecers, such as uh, respect for provincial autonomy and so on and so forth, while still saying, you know, if we're getting to the Supreme Court, uh, the federal government will be asked whether they want to intervene, and I think we should. Uh, so, so, um, I think this demonstrates that Charest knows the ground game in Quebec a lot better than, than Patrick Brown does. Uh, and Patrick Brown had sort of already painted himself in a corner when he was still mayor of Brampton playing his home game on Bill 21. What do you make of the fact that the pretty much the entire slate of candidates, as you say, Charest was a bit more uh, moderate in his position, but you know, not saying that he was in favor of Bill 21. But what do you make of the fact that you have all six of these candidates who are more or less against it? It seems like a big move since just a couple of years ago when you know the party just wanted to leave it be within Quebec's jurisdiction and not get too involved. You had Roman Babber at one point asking people to say no to the Legault government, which is really a big shift considering that uh, Francois Legault endorsed more or less Aaron O'Toole in the last mm -hmm. federal election. It seems like there's been a big movement in just really the last year. 
Yeah, I think, well, this is in part, I think, because uh, Bill 21 has been making its way through the courts, right? And, and so we've already uh, seen glimpses of what a court decision could look like if it does make it to the Supreme Court. And as, uh, as we know, it is not bulletproof. Proof, uh, despite the fact that uh, the uh, the Legault government has used the notwithstanding clause, uh, we need to be reminded that the notwithstanding clause does not cover the entirety of uh, charter uh, charter sections. And uh, for example, the Anglo Quebecer minority has been successful at finding a loophole through language rights in order to to carve out a specificity for English Quebecer um, uh, school boards to to be exempt from from Bill 21. Uh, so, so, so that's, I think, one thing. Uh, the other thing, I think, is just a question of, of timing at this point. Bill 21 has been brought back into the limelight. Uh, you know, Bill 96 was adopted just two days ago in, uh, in, in the National Assembly. And there's a lot of parallels that are drawn between these two bills because they are seen as being very nationalistic. Both bills where the notwithstanding clause was used preemptively, which, as we're hearing from the federal government, is not... Uh, something that is particularly appreciated in Ottawa. Um, and, and so I think this is the reason why these two bills took specifically last night uh, so much space in the debate, aside from the fact, of course, that this debate was taking place in Laval and that uh, the uh, the audience uh, the specifically listening last night was probably curious to hear what these folks had to say about it. It's definitely a complicated game for the uh, candidates because certainly uh, those who are socially conservative um, see Bill 21 as an attack on on religious uh, freedoms, and so that's why, in one way, that's partially why you have Patrick Brown, Leslie Lewis, and Robin Baber going very hard against it because they know that that is an issue that is really important to the social conservative uh, wing of the base. You have the fact that the conservatives want to make inroads in the GTA where there's a more diverse uh, voter base that is also going to be opposed to something like Bill 21, but then you do have. The prospects of gains in Quebec. And you did have Jean Charest talk about how he was going to be the retirement plan for the 32 Bloc MPs. The Bloc MPs are not exactly people who are going to be agreeing with the Conservatives on Bill 21. The Bloc is obviously pro Bill 21 and wants the federal government to stay out of it. So I don't know, what is the answer here? Is there an answer here for how they can balance all of these different things? Well, and I think, again, this is why Charest is being a lot more prudent than some of his counterparts with respect to his rhetoric on Bill 21, because uh, he knows that uh, those 32 MPs uh, from the Bloc Québécois that he wishes to retire have been more or less in the past few years uh, the main spokespeople for François Legault in Ottawa. Uh, the, uh, the, the Blanchet team has been aligning very closely on uh, nationalist items such as Bill 21, uh, with uh, with the CAC and have been very successful at it. They know the stats. They know that about 60% of Quebecers uh, do agree with Bill 21. Again, as detestable as this bill may seem uh, in other regions of Quebec, as well as, as you said, in the GTA. And this is why Patrick Brown played, played this card very heavily in his hometown. Uh, and but But that could cost him a lot, I think, in Quebec. And, and um, I think the, the one who really gets the ground game here is Charest. He knows that he can't have a hard, uh, a hard stance on, on Bill 21 uh, if he wants to, uh, to have a chance at, um, at, at surviving past even uh, the, um, the, the, the leadership campaign and, and really having a run at prime ministership. Yeah, and the fact that you know the crowd in Laval uh, was just about as well behaved as in Edmonton in terms of uh, applauding and interjecting, but in Edmonton it was very pro Poliev, and in Quebec you could see that it was much more divided. There was uh, almost as much applause for Charest and sometimes more than Poliev. How do you think Poliev handled this differently now that he was on turf that wasn't as friendly? And it, it seemed like he at times was a little bit more uh, on the defensive and not as not as able to defend himself. Maybe it was a, li a linguistic thing, but he seems sometimes a little bit uneven. Um, I think he he showed uh, a fair bit of discipline considering how uh, the odds were really against him last night compared to Edmonton, where he was in much friendlier territory. Uh, but but he, he, he was on the defensive essentially the whole time. Every time he went on the attack, either Jean Charest 
uh, came really prepared, I have to say, with, you know, uh, <laughs> very uh, factual items or even sometimes citations when, when uh, the Charbonneau Commission came up, for example, on, on allegations of uh, impropriety in, in, in spending in the Liberal Party of Quebec. Uh, saying, you know, I've been cleared of this, uh, the, 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 the uh, examination has been done, uh, you need to do a better job at doing your homework, uh, do you want my notes, you know, just sort of trolling him, or it was Patrick Brown who was jumping in, trying to cut uh, Poiliev off, uh, which he did a lot less of in, in Edmonton two weeks ago, so uh, I think uh, it was a much tougher night for Poiliev, despite the fact that uh, there was still, from what we could hear in the crowd, a, a still a sizable portion of uh, of the folks there who were uh, who were huge supporters of him. What do you think that says about Poliev's chances in Quebec? Because I think there is an assumption, which is probably too strong, that Quebec is going to be Charest's territory is going to win a huge amount of that vote. I think there is going to be a lot of conservatives who probably think of Charest as a Quebec liberal. I know that. Charest will say it's a coalition, but still, uh, there was a lot of people who voted for, let's say, the ADQ or the CAQ in the past who see Charest not as a fellow traveler. So what do you think it says about Poliev's ability to, to win a significant amount of votes in Quebec? I don't think Charest has, uh, has Quebec in his back pocket just yet. Uh, he walked into this race with a lot of baggage. You know, the fact that he was cleared from the Charbonneau Commission doesn't mean that people uh, will necessarily believe uh, the outcome of the of the report, uh, and and he is a, a premier who uh, had a long run in the National Assembly, and that means a lot of baggage and some baggage that uh, some folks may not like. Uh, you know, he was uh, seen by the the youth about ten years ago as the main culprit for uh, for for the reasons of the uh, the Printemps Arabe, the, the the Maple Spring, where uh, we had uh, monster demonstrations in, in, in Montreal and Quebec City, uh, mostly students, but, but the, the ras-le-bol, if you want, the, uh, the annoyance with the, with the government in Quebec uh, went really above and beyond just the, the student electorate. Um, and uh, it was, he is seen as, as a premier who uh, did fiscally a lot of good for the province, but that came at the expense of, of uh, public services. Uh, notably in the domain of health, and I think he's still vul vulnerable to that. So um, it, he's not someone who walked away from provincial politics as a champion. Uh, he's had 10 years to, you know, have some of this stuff blow over. But, uh, but I think Poiliev and, and the fact that Poiliev speaks a much better French than Aaron O'Toole or even Andrew Scheer did, for example, does give him um, a chance to, uh, to, to, to get some votes. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a couple funny lines, I would say, about uh, that whole thing. At one point, Charest went, uh, was criticizing something Poliev said about Charest's own record, saying that was 15 years ago. And then at the same time, also boasting about his record, which is, of course, 15 years old. Um, and there was also the time when Poliev uh, said at one point, you know, that Charest was, was someone from the past. And Charest said, you know, there's so many people who've tried to retire me politically, but I'm still here. Poilier have made the point that Quebecers retired you in 2012 when you lost the election. So, you know, it does go, it is a little bit rough sometimes to try to rely too much on your record if it's not exactly a clean slate entirely. So we've now had two debates, official debates. There was the unofficial debate where Patrick Brown didn't go to that one, the first one. Um, now that we've had those two debates, we're a week uh, before the membership cutoff. What do you think that has happened? What do you think the debates have done? Uh, is Poliev still as much of the front runner as he seemed to be maybe two months ago? Well, we'll find out for sure on June 3rd when we see how many memberships, uh, membership cards each of the candidates has, uh, has, has been able to sell. Uh, I think from, from the conservative basis standpoint, uh, Poliev is definitely still uh, the front runner at this point. Uh, I'm, I may be mistaken in a week, uh, but we'll see. What we've noticed, though, is that Jean Charest has been uh, pretty good at raising funds. Uh, I think much, uh, much better than some people expected, considering that uh, Poiliev has had a much longer runway to, uh, to, to do so than him. Uh, we need to understand that Pierre Poiliev uh, started running for the for the leadership almost two years ago at this point. I remember the the 2019 um, election campaign where uh, he was 
more or less already, you know, gathering data, trying to, 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 to get a, a support base. Uh, and so his database is far more extensive than any other of the five candidates out there. Uh, and, and despite that, uh, Jean Charest has been impressing in, in, in the amount of fundraising that he's been able to do. So I think that speaks to the strength of his candidacy. But at the end of the day, uh, it will uh, come down to those uh, 338 writings and how many points each of the candidates is, a, is able to get. Because we need to remember that the rules have also changed a little bit since the last uh, leadership race, where if there is not 100 uh, members in a single writing, then that writing will not be worth 100 points. And so that might also play against Charest, because oftentimes Quebec is seen as uh, an easy gain uh, by, some, uh, by some conservatives because uh, the Conservative Party of Canada in some of those writings just does not have a big base, unlike you know, Calgary, for example, where you have thousands of members in every single one of those writings. Uh, and, and, and so um, if Jean Charest has been able to sell a sufficient amount of memberships in order for those 70 writings to be worth 100 points, then uh, he'll be in a better position. But I'm skeptical of that at this point. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what numbers kind of come out, what, what the Conservative Party will put out. If I recall correctly, in the last uh, leadership race, there was around 50 ridings in Quebec that didn't meet the uh, 100 membership threshold. So we'll see if Chate is going to be able to at least find 100 people in uh, those ridings to try to uh, even the score. And we've heard that the number of members could end up being somewhere around 400,000, which is a lot more than in the previous uh, campaign. So um, I'll be very curious to see what the number will be and what the various claims will be from the campaigns. They'll each, they'll each say that they've ra you know they've signed up this many members and it'll add up to more than 400,000. So we'll have to wait and see what the results will be. Right, exactly. So uh, appreciate you coming on. Uh, the French debate uh, was had some interesting moments, had some difficult moments to uh, get through, but uh, it I think was revealing. So I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your thoughts with us today. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. And thanks to Stephanie Srinav for that discussion. And if you liked it and you like that podcast, I hope that you'll subscribe to it. You'll subscribe to this YouTube channel and you'll subscribe to the writ.ca. You can head over there to get access to all the exclusive content. And a little bit of a programming note, usually have a podcast up and a podcast video up every Friday morning. Might not have one next week because of the Ontario election, but I will have one either Tuesday or Wednesday with Philippe J. Fournier. We're going to go over all the polls, all the projections ahead of the election. And that election on June 2nd is going to be one to watch. So thanks for watching this podcast and I'll see you next time.